Okay, so Keith asked me, Keith from 5 Watt World, by the way, um, rather unexpectedly last week, do you know anyone with a casino, an Epiphone casino or a Gibson casino? Because I sort of last minute need someone to do the intro music to one of my videos. And I'm a friend of Keith's. I think we could call each other friends probably, can't we? OF. Of course, I was like, yes. And I think I know the perfect one for the job. So Gary Townsend, a uh, friend, I used to play in a band with him. I played keyboard and he played keys and we were in like this 60s tribute band called Carnaby Street and he has this Epiphone Casino. Now I believe it's got a sticker in it that says uh, made in Kalamazoo and all that stuff but I think it's one of the kind of 2003-ish revolution models. Now those are relatively collectible now I think. Here's one suffered an unfortunate headstock break during a rehearsal which was devastating. Now, the, the thing that stands out to me about this guitar is that to me evokes what I'd expect when I play an ES-335 or pick up an ES-335. Like an ES-335 kind of looks like it should be a fairly lightweight guitar, right? Um, but when you pick them up because of that center block, they're often quite heavy. The Casino, on the other hand, to me feels super lightweight and sort of like, um, I don't know, it's just very, very different. It's got that kind of big body still, but it just feels very light to play and stuff. And the neck on it is pretty, um, it's lightweight. The pickups are, I feel like they're quite low output. It's quite a unique thing. And as well as having that kind of tail piece, which is kind of close to the jazz hollow body that I might play the ES-165. So the casino itself, uh, if you want to know more about the history, go and check out uh, Keith's video on it. But I just wanted to talk through that video and some of the tones because I think apparently some people are vaguely interested in the tones. Now let me know if you want me to drop these into the folder. What I've done, I actually created this just plugging in DI and then went back with Helix Native and created the tones. Um, so I'll break them down individually but I could create these for HX Stomp. All I have to do is make a little bit of an alteration. So I was using the ADT doubler effect for the clean tone um, which I had on like a separate path, which I'd have to take that off. Um, the amps that I was using, I was using an AC30 and a Supro, like a dual amp kind of setup, because I know that those are amps that were around in that time. And yeah, relatively simple preset. Because of the, the nature of these pickups, I was able to run those quite a lot brighter than I normally would to try and get that kind of jangly, chimey thing. And then the main lead tone is kind of a, a take on my Eric Johnson inspired lead tone, but with a bit more highs and stuff and uh, a bit less gain. Trying to get that kind of singing thing, singing sustaining, that's what I'm going for. So leave a comment below if you want me to drop these into the folder in Helix format, HX Stomp format, uh, and Helix native format, I guess. But now let's just, I guess, dig into the presets a little bit. Uncomfortably close. So here we have the Reaper project, and my clean tone is this, I believe. Um, so we've got at the end here of the preset the ADT, so this was actually kind of a recreation by Line 6 of the kind of classic thing that you had in Abbey Road at the time, the automatic double tracking thing, and it's kind of two tape reels, um, and the delay setting on one reel is 3 milliseconds, the delay on the other reel is 50, the wow flutter is at 2.9 for both, and the deck volume of one is naught and the deck volume of two is minus three. Not inverting the polarity, no modulation, and tape speed 15 IPS. Texture 6.3, low cut at 62, high cut at 12, and then I'm panning them hard left and hard, hard right. You have to be careful doing this because when you listen to it on a phone, it's possibly gonna sound a bit weird, depending on your phone. When you collapse these things to mono, they don't always come out the best. At the top here we've got a split so that our path gets kind of split into dual amp. On the one hand we've got the Essex A30, so this is a top boost box AC30, the drive at 4.2, the bass at 5, the cut off, the treble at 8.2 and the presence at 0 because there is no presence control. But you see that treble is running quite high especially for a Vox style amp so I think it probably shows you that the pickups in these casinos are potentially quite uh, dark sounding, I guess, would be my takeaway from that. And the master all the way up, because we don't have a master volume. Then I've got uh, Hot Springs, 
pretty much default settings I think, except I've set the drip to high, spring count to 2, dwell at 4, mix at 42. Then this is only on the Vox AC30, sort of doing like a wet dry type thing. Then I've got the Supro um, based on a, an, an old amp from around this kind of era, maybe a bit before. Drive at 6, bass at 5, tone at 9.4, treble at 5.5, presence at 7. Again, pretty bright I'd suggest. And uh, yeah, again, master all the way because we don't actually have a master on that rear lamp. And then I'm going into two kind of typical speakers that you'd see in the Vox amplifiers of the time. The Blue Bell, which is obviously an Alnico Blue, with the 57 dynamic, one inch away from the cone, high cut off. Again, just we want as many of these kind of chimey qualities as possible, was the, the thinking of this. And then the Silver Bell with a 121 ribbon, distance five inches away, and again, no high cut. So pretty simple that for the clean tone. I've got my kind of mid gain tone, which is this one here. Okay, uh, so what I've done is taken the same principle, the same preset basically, I think, and exactly the same stuff going on, except I've upped the early reflections to give a bit more re room sound, and taken this high cut down to really smooth things out, so that's down to 3.4 kilohertz, and again on the silver bell, down to 4.4 kilohertz, and even more room reflections. Um, sort of to give the impact of having it in a room. Uh, I think at the time of the kind of Beatles recordings, things were relatively primitive and you'd have kind of a lot of room sound in those recordings anyway. Then I'm using a tube screamer in front of the amps, which of course the tube screamer was not invented yet, but whatever, it does a thing that I like. So the gain is at 7.4, tone is at 6.5, treble is at 6.7. I don't think anything has changed on the amps. Then I'm going into a tape delay, um, again I don't think this would have actually been invented at the time but we've got 507 milliseconds, scale at 100%, wire flutter at 4.7, feedback at 54, mix at 32, spread at 5.2. I've increased the headroom parameter so that we don't get clipping and artifacts from overdriving the input of the tape. Um, and then we're using the glitz reverb which again wouldn't have been around at the time but this is just to keep me comfortable. Um, with default settings, I've just set the mix to 19%. My main lead tone is here. Um, this is the Eric Lead Gary, but I've got it on snapshot one, which is the lower gain snapshot. We've got a compressor pushing the front of this, so the red squeeze, the MXR Dynacomp, is it called, I think, uh, with a sensitivity at 3.8, mix at 83%, and the level at plus 12, so quite a kind of clean ish boost into the Line 6 Litigator, the drive at 9.1, the bass at 5.6, the mid dimed and the treble and presence all the way off. Looks extreme, but I think it sounds pretty cool. Master at 5. Then I'm using an IR here, and the high cut at 7.3. Um, the IR is based on like a V30 type thing, a Mezaboogie style cab, so something with V30s might be a good start point. Then a dual delay, left time, 375, right time 500 milliseconds, left feedback 76, right feedback 74, left mix 26, right mix 25, and no modulation on that. And then all of that go into a glitz reverb with a decay at 5.1, pre-delay off, uh, high cut at 15.5, mix at 22, and delay 64, rate 1.8, depth 3.8, crossover at 900 hertz, and mod mix at five. So those are the, the, the three tones you hear me playing with in the video. Again, let me know if you want me to drop those into the folder. Um, I'm not sure exactly how accurate or anything they are to the time. Uh, I don't really have the skills or the information to be able to get that kind of thing going. It's just the tones that I like to play with and I was trying to evoke that sort of thing a little bit. Um, so hopefully that's not too sacrilegious. Let me know the tune that I was playing on, by the way, if you want to. Uh, it was one specific Beatles tune that I was trying to channel that had been mentioned to me just before by Gary. So that's that. So that's the, the project as well. I had a little bit of singing on there, um, which is different for me. And I think I was using Native Instruments, the Abbey Road 60s drummer, um, and then some kind of vinyl sounds as well. Um, but yeah. Hopefully that was vaguely interesting to you. 
Now here are some outtakes of some other solos that I didn't use. Um, thank you for stopping by. Thanks to Keith for having me on the video. And I'll catch you in another video soon. Cheers.